Well, bless the Lord. <clears throat> Hope everybody is well. Um, you know, I changed my mind about three times of what the what I wanted to share. In fact, the message I brought was called "Why Sickness," and uh, did that in 2018. So it's been a year and a half or so since it's been taught. But last night, late, I just got looking through the scriptures and uh, printed out some scriptures, and I want to share these scriptures with you because it's it's something to think about with what's going on, you know, with this virus. <clears throat> so you know, you want to, you know, I think most of us want to make a decision: do do I uh, fear it, or do I just boldly don't worry about it? Do I stay six foot? Do I kiss people? Do I go out? Do I stay home? You know, there's there's that goes on, and, and the truth is, it's not a blanket answer. There's an answer for individuals. Uh, there can be an answer corporately. You know, if the government puts out a law, you can't travel, guess what? You're not going to travel. You can't go make the airplane guy fly you someplace when it's grounded. So there is that decision that you don't have to make, that you just have to go along with. Uh, you can uh, criticize it or whatever you want to do, but the truth is you can't do that. Now, biblically, you know, when you look at the Old Testament, when somebody was unclean, they had to go outside of the camp and stay there until they got cleaned and come in so many days and do, went through some rituals and all that. Of course, we get cleaned by confessing our sin and asking Jesus to, to forgive us, and we can get cleaned that way. Also, lepers were outside of the camp, and, you know, uh, it isn't like they had mass visitors. It's catchy, you know, and yet somebody like Jesus or a minister the Lord had said, you know, he went in and, and laid hands on the lepers and prayed for the lepers and healed the lepers. You know, uh, you know, if you're if you're sick and you know you have something that's contagious, it'd be foolish to be around people and coughing all over them and doing doing a thing and thinking, well, just where's your faith? Well, where's your faith? Where's your wisdom? You know, so to avoid that is not being full of unbelief. It can be wisdom. You still can pray for them, but yet it says, "Is any sick among you? What are you supposed to do?" Call for the elders of church. So who has to go visit the sick and go into their presence? Elders do. And so if we don't go by faith, we could get sick, but we're obeying the Lord, so it's up to his love to defend us. So the Lord will take care of you if you're in the right frame. Uh, uh, I was just thinking about, I don't know his name, so uh, I don't mean to, to make fun of him, because, uh, but the one basketball player who kind of made fun of it, then he got it. So I'm saying, watch yourself. You know, if you have faith to come to church and praise the Lord, not worry about it and greet somebody with a holy kiss, but if somebody you go to greet with a holy kiss, they take a step backwards, respect that. They'll go, oh, you're full of unbelief? Now you're arrogant, and they might be in the wisdom of the Lord. You, you don't have the right to judge that. You have the right to respect that. Okay, so, you know, hear what I'm saying to you. And, and this thing is going to run its course. It's going to do what it does. Uh, well, so far, West Virginia is the safe state. Think it's the moonshine? Cleans you inside and out. You can you can wipe down the counter and drink it too. Yeah, I mean it's just it got to be something close to Clorox. I don't know what it is, but or, or we just don't tell anybody. You know. Well, bless the Lord. But anyhow, really pray. And I'm I'm blessed with the president declaring a, a, a national day of prayer. We talked about walking by faith and not by fear and said some wonderful things. I didn't get to hear that, but what I was told, it was very good. I'd like to hear that. Uh, you know, how you view sickness, if you're sick, I pray that you're expecting to get well. You know, that we have a lively hope as Christians. I stand on his promises. He doesn't guarantee me I'll not get sick, but he tells me what to do when I am sick, and that's hope in the Lord. Rest, be at peace. Don't fight, don't fret, don't complain, don't say, why me? The testing of your faith is called precious. And so, uh, you know, what's nice about what God does, uh, in, in fact, on the teaching on, that when I teach about what is, why sickness, I teach it's caused from sin, it's caused from Satan, it's caused, from the, caused by deception, it's caused by judging. Don't judge people who are sick that they have little faith, because you'll find out maybe they had great faith and you have little faith. You know, God deals appropriately in, in the beauty of his, 
you know, he can be disciplining you because of your bad behavior or your bad attitude or your complaining or whatever it is that you do, or your unforgiveness. The Lord can make you sick. He does that. Some people think, oh, God doesn't. Know. Yes, he does. He can do it. It's, it's his right to do that. He can, dis, he can get you sick to discipline you, to get your attention so that you would cry out to him. Or it can be the testing of your faith. You know, Job, man, he, this guy got the boils. Awful. I've never had a boil, never want one, but I know people have had one, and they tell me it is awful. I can't imagine being covered with boils. And yet Job's friends judged him that he had to be in sin, and it wasn't the case. Job wasn't in sin. They were in sin for judging Job. Their theology said Job was in sin because he had to be in sin because why would he be sick if he was a righteous man? Didn't know that he was being tested and he came out of that test and God was mad at the ones who accused him and Job had to pray for them to get well. So be careful how you view those things. Now, in talking about sickness, something I never addressed in you know, the Bible talks about plagues. Well, what we have now, a pandemic. So we could call this a plague. I think that would be pretty appropriate. Something that's going worldwide and going global. And uh, God does plagues. I don't know if he's doing this one or why he's doing it. I don't know. But I know that he does that. Now, let me give you, I, I'm going to read you some of the Old Testament scriptures and some of the New Testament scriptures about plagues. Uh, here's a plague that, that we've preached about before, especially when I encourage you ladies, to, it says you're a daughter of Sarah, to have that quiet, gentle spirit, trust God, and just put it in his hands and go along with your husband. Well, when Job, I mean, when Abraham went into Egypt, he had this thought, my wife is beautiful. They're going to see that. They'll kill me and spare her. I don't know if you make sense to you, but when you read the Old Testament, you read how, how it was. People would see a, a beautiful lady or a beautiful virgin girl. They'd want to take her and give her, give her to the king. That's what they, that's what they, that's how you found favor. You know, you brought a good looking honey to the Pharaoh and he's going to say, hey, you know, I'll give you a job on the cabinet. Yeah. I don't know why, you know, I'm, I'm speculating, of course. But when, when Abraham went there, Abraham in in his faith, said, they'll kill me because my and see my wife is beautiful and take her. So he said to his wife, tell him you're my sister. And she did. And Pharaoh came and gave Abraham a bunch of money and stuff and took his wife. But something happened. His love defends me, but his love defended Sarah. Sarah's with Pharaoh in his household, and guess what happened? The household got a plague. A whole plague came on the household of Pharaoh. So what's going on here? Now, you know that incident happened another time in another land, but and, uh, Pharaoh comes and gets on Abraham, escorts, gives his wife back and escorts him out. But who gave the plague to Pharaoh's household? And he didn't kill Pharaoh because Pharaoh was innocent in it, but he gave him the plague to get his attention. He got his attention and said, give the wife back. That belongs to Abraham. Abraham's the Lord's. The Lord was protecting Abraham. Now, you see, you, it'd be easy to judge and say, why would Abraham do that? What kind of man is that who would say, tell me you're my sister so that you would, it would spare his own life? You could say, well, that was greedy and self-centered. And, and I want to say this to you. If you judge Abraham, you're a fool. Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham walked by faith. If it wasn't for Abraham being willing to sacrifice his son, I don't know if God would have been willing to sacrifice his son. Hear what I'm saying to you. Don't watch judging those Old Testament guys. They were in faith. Some of the stuff they did was almost a violation of what we see as right or, or the law. But it was before the law, and where there's no law, there's no sin imputed. And then when Moses came, that sin would be revealed. Understand that the law would be given that we would understand. When you do this, it's anti-God. When you do this, God, you find favor with God. And, and, and we're, we're taught that. But in Exodus 12, 13, it says, uh, the, the, uh, when he was cursing Egypt to bring out the children of Israel, he did a number of curses. 
But one thing he did in the final curse that did it was when he killed all the firstborn of Egypt. I mean, that woke that was a wake-up call. They endured everything else, got through everything else, but that kind of did it. But this applied to uh, Israel, and it applies to us. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will before, befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. They had to put the, the blood of a lamb above the doorpost and above on a lentil or whatever you call it. Post. And everybody in Egypt, all the firstborn, everything, firstborn children, firstborn animals, died. And no, none of them died in Egypt because when the, the death angel came by to execute the will of God, when he saw the blood, he passed over. And I want to say to you, if you've been washed in the blood of Jesus and you really believe you're forgiven, you thank God daily and you're aware always caring about in your body, the dying of Christ, and you're aware that he forgave you, that he shed his blood for you, he'll pass over you too. And we're to, we're to, we're to walk in that faith and, and believe that and sing that song, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you, that he would do that. But anyhow, in, in Israel, when Israel, you know, they were given the law, they saw the miraculous hand of God. I mean, they came out of, they were slaves in Egypt. Not in the beginning. In the beginning, they were favored. In the end, they were slaves. And God did mighty wonders. And even says he raised up Pharaoh. He, he, he let the king of Egypt be a hardhead who was stubborn, who said, who's the Lord that I should obey him? And kept beating him up, beating him up, beating him up, beating him up until finally when the firstborn died, he said, get him out of here. And so Israel saw that. And when Israel complained, a plague would break out. Now, I don't know if I'm in the right place here. And a, a, a plague could break out because of the sin in the camp. Okay? That would be like sin in the church. Let's say. A plague could break out. And what's amazing, the plague very most often was stopped by one person. You know, in one place, I think Aaron took the censer and ran among the people and did the censer and stayed the plague. Another time, I think, at Eliezer, I think it was his son who was one. Of, it was a priest. Uh, I need to tell you this story. I need to tell you that one. Okay, good. Let me read some of this to you, and now I'll get back to the story I want to tell you about. I want to tell you a story about Balaam. I think it's a very interesting story. But anyhow, it says, uh, when you take a censor of the a census of the sons of Israel, number them, then each one of them shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord when you number them, so that there will be no plague among them when you number them. So when they numbered the children of Egypt and they counted them and took a census, you had to give something to the counter. The people were counting you. And it goes on, it says, uh, you give something so there'll be no plague. Okay, you know, you, you, this is during Moses' time. They're going to count the children of Israel. Every child, everybody who's counted has to give something. If you, you Bible students, remember David took a census and got cursed for it? He didn't take anything. He didn't do it the way you're supposed to do it. And people die when leadership makes mistakes. And David was given numerous options, and he, and he took the most that would affect him the most and not the people because he knew it was his fault. But still, people die. You know, when you're part of a body like this, or in, in any church, if you live in sin, you hurt that body, and somebody dies on account of it. And what do I mean by that? Somebody sees you do it, and they dare to do it. Or some young person is going to church with you, and they see you, and they, they, they you know you smoke dope or, or run around and cheat and whatever you're doing, and, and they imitate it because, well, he's a believer, and they do that. Young people have that mindset. Well, they're Christians, and, they, you know, they're a Christian. They can do that. Why can't I? You know, they're, 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 they go to church. Why, if they wear those clothes, why can't I wear those clothes? And they debate with parents and authority. So you can cause people to stumble by that. So anyhow, just by not doing what they're supposed to do, it, bring, it brings a plague. So we need to be aware of that. Now, again, I'm not real prepared for this. I just read this last night, and I figured I just wanted to read it this morning to you. If you, if, if then you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plagues on you seven times according to your sins. 
God promises you that. Now you say, but that was the Old Testament. That's those under the law. Right. They didn't fulfill the law. They didn't do the law. They didn't keep the law. And plagues came. It got so bad with Israel, several times he ran them out of the nation. He turned them over to their enemies. What makes you think as a believer who we are given great grace, we have total forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ, we have the promise of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, we are empowered to understand this thing, we can see the scriptures and understand the scriptures, we have a grace and a power to overcome all of these things with that. In other words, if we trample underfoot the blood of Jesus, in other words, if I disobey God, why do you think it would be easier for us than it was the Old Testament who their blood was bulls, goats, rams, and lambs? It wasn't, it wasn't permanent forgiveness. We have, we have forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus. So what I'm saying to you, don't think you can live in sin and just get away with it and it's going to be okay. The Lord will discipline you. The Lord will deal with you. And, and I believe whole nations, when they get a mentality of sin, can be cursed with a plague. Now, the beauty of me knowing that is this. I know that, but I'm not sure not going to judge that. You know, when we have a tsunami and a nation gets wiped out, I know who's in charge of the sea and the air and the land. That's the Lord, you know. I know in, in, in you know, there's plagues that have gone on in, in the past where people have died. There's, you know, black, there's all kind of plagues throughout history. But I don't know the times. I don't know what was going on at that time. You know, when you we watch it, our country, you know, to me, America was blessed because America was, I, one of our founders said this. I wish I could tell you who it was. I don't remember. America has no king but Jesus. And if we stay in that mode, this nation will be blessed and protected. But when we begin to let, lower down the standard and we let sin encroach, here's an example of sin encroaching. Homosexuality was repulsive to most people in this country. It's not now. Now, people, Christians aren't practicing homosexuality, but oh well. We've accepted it. Come on, we had a man run for president who kissed his husband on the stage, mouth to mouth. And, you know, the shock value goes away. Well, what are you going to do? Well, that's the way it is. Pretty soon, it's like the first time you saw this stuff on TV, you go, change the channel. I ain't watching that. Now it's to the point you can't watch TV because it's on every, every station. Now, I hope and I believe that we're not ready for judgment yet. But what I'm trying to demonstrate to you, it just erodes away. The devil doesn't come and just jerk it out. He doesn't come and tell you, denounce Jesus. You know, tell him, take a hike, devil. You're not going to do that. But he can ooze you, ease you in. Come on. You know, how many Christians go to church, profess the Lord, sing praises to God, they're not married? And we don't think anything of it. You know, the word says modest apparel. We go to church and live our lives and we're far from modest today. It's eroding away, but it erodes away and we accept it. We accept it. Well, I don't see nothing wrong with it. I don't know where God draws his line, but he does draw a line. He knows what you know. He knows what he's called you to account to. And there comes a time it gets offensive to God. And when things are an abomination to God, he gets angry and pours out his wrath. You know what his wrath is? A plague or sickness. It beats you up. He does that. Not a popular message today. We want to hear Jesus loves you unconditionally. No, he don't. He loves you. He died for you. He paid a price for you. Unconditionally, he bought your soul, and you owe your life to him, and you're to walk in faith and trust him, and he'll save you and do a wonderful work in your life. But if you think you can call on the name of Jesus and live in sin, that you can fornicate, commit adultery, be a drunkard, and you're going to go to heaven because you named the name of Jesus, he'll say, I never knew you. Don't set yourself up for a plague. The worst plague in the world is to go to hell. That's a permanent plague. In Leviticus it says, <clears throat> If then you will act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. According to your sins. It isn't like God sitting up, everybody's doing wonderful, walking in faith. He goes, I think I'll give him a plague. There's things I've, I've thought that I don't want to say. You know, like things that have happened in the past, and nations that have been beat up real bad, and you wonder, hmm, 
I didn't live there before it happened. I don't know what's going on, but if they're engrossed in gross sin and gross immorality, Lord will judge a nation. You know, he'll judge you by your own standard if you don't have his standard. And you'll drop the ball. He says, I gave the Levites as a gift to Aaron and to his sons from whom, from among the sons of Israel to perform service of the sons of Israel at the tent of meeting and to make atonement on behalf of the sons of Israel so that there will be no plague among the sons of Israel by, when they come near to the sanctuary. If you were unworthy and you were in sin and you went to church, the sanctuary, you went to the tent, or the, you got a plague. He says, they tried to do all the stuff to keep you from getting a plague. So that does happen. Now, God is so good that he, he, he leaves room for your ignorance but he judges you appropriately. And I'll say this to you. You do not have the right to remain ignorant. I hope it, a new believer who's never been to church, been in the world, comes to church and they hear a message. They'll hear a message that goes, well, I never knew that. Well, God's not holding you accountable to it. But now that you know it, you, you, you start becoming accountable to it. And the truth is, you want to be accountable. I pray that every Christian can say what David said. Test me, O Lord, and see my heart. See if there be any unclean thing in me. Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. We depend on Jesus for that. I don't depend on my righteousness, my goodness, and my strength. I depend on the strength that comes from above. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive power. We receive power to overcome sin. That's the whole purpose of this. What the law couldn't do, weak as was in the flesh. You know what that means? You could know the commandments. You could know it inside out. You could have that law, my, law memorized. But because of your nature, you're going to sin until Jesus comes. And his blood cleanses you from your sin and his spirit empowers you to overcome your flesh. What's that mean? I quit being me. I die to myself. I die to every lust and every desire that's in me to do wrong. Every lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, lust of the wrong thoughts. I deal with all of that through the Holy Spirit who strengthens me, who enlightens me. And over time I grow in grace and I deal step at a time until we come to the full day where I see the kingdom. I see the Lord and I want to glorify the Lord. Do you understand you're not your own? The truth is it's not about you. This is about Jesus, that you glorify him with your life. And, you're the only, and you can only do what you can do. I can't make everybody else obey the Lord. But everything I preach to you, I have to do, and I have to walk in it as much as you do. Because I'm standing here doesn't mean I'm not sitting out there. Remember the people, the children of Israel, because God does some things you want to question him, but don't dare do that. We don't call God into account. Well, and people do that. Think how arrogant this is. Well, if God's so good, why did he let a baby die? You're going to call his, him into judge? You're going to call him to give you an account? Let me see the universe you created. Let me see the wisdom that you made to make all this work before you, you, you ask. You understand? That's, that's very arrogant. All of creation, we shared last week, all of creation bears witness to the glory of God, to his awesomeness, his greatness, his wisdom, his insight, his understanding is, is out there. I mean, just look around. My God, look at yourself. Marvelously and wonderfully made, made in the image and likeness of God, created in your mother's womb. It's like, and you're going to say, God, why, you know, God, why do you let people die? Why did you let this plague come? Why did you, why did you, who gave you the right to ask? Question God? If God were so good, why did he let people die? He let them die for like you. You know, be opposed to the proud to give grace to the humble. You get arrogant, you're going to bite the bullet. But anyhow, sons of Israel grumbled over manna again and manna again. Do you understand? All they had to do is walk out with a bushel basket, pick it up, and they fix it neat. They're in a desert. There's nothing growing out there. There's no apple orchards or, or coconut trees or whatever. They're in the desert. 600,000 men. And there's enough for them to eat. And, and they got the um, manna again. 
if somebody was giving, if I was starving, if I was living in the desert and there was no food and somebody gave me a Big Mac every day, I'd, I'd bless it every day and like it every day. And it's like, but they complain. God provided for them. And because they complained, God got ticked and said, and Moses had cried out, what am I to do, God? I can't, how am I supposed to take care of this? And I think for Moses, okay, he sent a bunch of quail outside the camp, stacked up, they went out, man, had a party time, started eating the quail, I didn't even know if they cooked it. But God got angry, and a plague came. While the food was still in their mouth, and it began to die. Thank God for somebody who stopped the plague. While the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very severe plague. Finally stops. How many how many thousands of people die? Do you know that every year in this country with the flu, I mean over 30,000 30, people die with the flu every year. So far with this virus in America, where are we up to? About 100? Uh, how many have died? Over 50? Hopefully we can keep that number down, but it's going to be a tough job to do. I'm praying that the, the hand of the Lord is in this because then it won't grow exponentially. How do you say that? It's going to multiply. If God says stop, it'll stop. If he lets it go, it needs to be let go. And God's judgment is right. God made Aaron, I mean, Moses made Aaron the high priest. Some in the congregation were jealous. Why should Aaron be a high priest? Why aren't we all holy and equal to God? And God called a meeting of all the leaders, but Korah and his family and friends did, did not go to the meeting. It's called a rebellion of Korah, questioning Moses. God spoke to Moses. God sought to met with Moses on the mountain. Moses fasted 40 days and 40 nights, went back and did it again. God was with him. Everything he said happened. He got to let him out. And so anyhow, they wouldn't come and they grumbled over that. And, here, and they died. You know, in fact, Moses went down to Corinth and camp and said, get away from them, all of you who are going to follow me. And if the Lord doesn't kill them in, a, in any way but a natural way, then the Lord's not with them. And what happened, Korah and his family and their tents, the earth opened up, and the earth closed his mouth again. Now, you can read that and say, oh, come on, that really happened? That's a historical fact. It did happen. And they died. Rebellion is sin. Rebellion isn't sin of witchcraft. You understand? It, it, it ruins things. It ruins families. So what happens, that happens, and you should say, I mean, I, I think I've, if I was there, I'd go, I'm going to stick with Moses. I mean, you're right, buddy. What do you want me to do, jump? <laughs> I mean, geez. But here's what happened. But on the next day, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron say, you're the ones who caused the death of the Lord's people. So anyhow, Rebellion is there. Plague goes out. And Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer and put fire in it from the altar and lay incense on it. Then bring it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone forth from the Lord. The plague has begun. They rebelled against Moses. The plague breaks out because God's upset at that. And Moses intercedes to stop the plague for the people. And Aaron did, does that and stays the plague. Who did it? Aaron, at Moses' direction. Then Aaron took it as Moses had spoken and ran into the midst of the assembly, for behold, the plague had begun among the people. So he put the incense and made atonement for the people. In numbers in the next verse says, He took a stand between the dead and the living so that the plague was checked. says, Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the council. Oh, okay, I want to tell you this story. 
Sorry, I don't have this laid out very good. I just got a bunch of scriptures here. Do you know the story of Balaam? Okay, Israel came out. They want to go through their land, and everybody told them no. They had some wars and fights, but Israelites always prevailed because God was with them. And so uh, Balak, who is the king of, somebody help me, Midian? Midian? I'm not sure, but anyhow, in this country. And he sees them coming and go, oh, man, man, they're going to devour our land. They're going to beat us. They're going to kill us. And he, he wants them cursed. He knows they're blessed. Everything they're doing is working. So he goes to a prophet. Now, this prophet is named Balaam. You know, you know the story of Balaam's donkey? And, and Balaam goes, they, they go and offer him money to come. And he goes, no, I can't go. And they go away and they come back with more money. And he goes, well, I'll go talk to the Lord. And the Lord goes, go, but only under this condition. You can only say what I say for you to say. And he lets him go. Well, what's funny is sometimes when you, when you press the Lord a number of times to get to do something, it irritates him a bit. And he was going to, he got mad at Balaam because why would you press this? You should have just took my word the first time instead of trying to do it the second time. But he's riding his donkey, his mule, and the mule saw the angel of the Lord with a sword going to kill Balaam. And the donkey backed up and pushed his leg against the wall, and Balaam beat, beat his donkey with a stick, and the donkey spoke with a man's voice. And by the way, it says, it didn't say somebody spoke through the donkey. It said the donkey said, why are you doing that? Don't you know I've been faithful? Because he nailed down. He wouldn't go because he could see the angel. But he figured if he takes a swipe at my master, he's going to get me too. So, so a- anyhow, so anyhow, Balaam goes, and you're reading the story, and then you, you keep seeing that Balaam is, is kind of noble. You know, he keeps kind of holding to it. So Balak talks to him and says, why didn't you come the first time? Don't you know I can't give you money? You know, the world way of doing things. And uh, he says, well, build seven altars and seven things and do this and do that, and I'll go seek the Lord. And he goes, seeks the Lord, comes back, and he makes a prophecy that the Lord's blessing Israel. You're not going to prevail against them, da 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 that kind of thing. And Balak the king goes, come on, I paid you money, got you here, and you blessed them instead of cursing them. Here, come over here. Let's go on the mountain so you can see them. You can see the tail end of the people. Man, there's a lot of people. He goes, okay, build seven more altars and do seven more bulls and seven more whatever sacrifices and make them, and I'll go see what the Lord says. And he comes back, same thing. You know, I'll bless those who are, the blessing of God will be on the Israelites and all that. And Balak is just bummed out. And that kind of story ends there, and you're going, hmm, I wonder what came of that. Well, what came of that was Balaam wanted the money. He says, well, I can't prophesy against him with the Lord, but I'll give you some counsel. When they come into the land, you get the, the little honeys that you have in your land to go to the Israelite guys and say, hey, come with us to our church and worship our God. That's ba- Balaam gave Balak that, that counsel, and they did that. And the, the guys went, and woohoo, these good-looking girls and what, there's nothing wrong with their church, you know. They go to church too. They believe in God too. Sound familiar? But anyhow, well, it's getting bad. And then one of the guys very boldly gets one of those girls and comes right back into camp in front of Moses, you know, and comes into camp. And I think it's Eleazar, one of the priests, who takes a spear. And he goes in and puts a spear through both of them. And stopped the plague because a plague had come upon Israel for them doing that, have, worshiping a false god. You know the first time people, somebody was stoned in the Old Testament was for picking up manna on the Sabbath? But sometimes I think our sin, we can even wear God down. We go, <laughs> They got attacked. They killed Balak and Balaam. They killed Balaam. So he deserved to die. Anyhow, but he counseled them to sin. And if God's for you, you he'll protect you. He'll be with you. But you cannot live in sin. And I, and I pray that you get, get, get catch on to this. In the kingdom, it's a righteous spirit that you have. And it only comes from a righteous heart. That you're filled with the love of God. That you care about people. You're not self-centered. You don't have to be about you. You look to serve. You look to help. You look to pray. You worship God. 
If you have wrong thoughts, you deal with your wrong thoughts. You got a bad attitude, you get mad about something, you, you check yourself. If you bark at your wife, you get mad at your husband or whatever, that you go, God, have mercy on me. Because it's about you and the Lord. Now, when you and the Lord are right, everything else gets right. But you got to do it God's way. Okay, in Deuteronomy 28, it says, the Lord will bring, this is the curse of the law. There's the blessing of the law. Read Deuteronomy 28. Everybody should read it. I don't even like to read it in church because it gets pretty gross. The good part is if you do the law, if you fulfill the law, which by the grace of God we can, understand that? We can, we can keep the commandments by the grace of God, that you'll be blessed going in, blessed coming out, blessed in the city, blessed in the country, everything. You, you, you'll have every, all your needs. And that's true. One reason America's prosperous. Over the years, our, our, our moral standard was the Ten Commandments and faith in Jesus Christ. That, that's really good. But when you do wrong, now let me read to you. Then the Lord will bring extraordinary plagues on you and your descendants, even severe and lasting plagues and miserable and chronic sicknesses. If you violate the law of God. You can't live in sin and think you're going to be okay, especially when you know better. Somebody out there in darkness, they need to see the light. You, especially us who were raised in church, who were raised by moral parents, who taught us these things, it's worse for us when we violate than some sinner who don't know up from down. Just like with Nineveh. You know, Jonah was upset because God didn't destroy Nineveh. And he, God says, that Jonah, they don't know their right hand from their left, but they repented. They, they, they were trying to get it right, and God spared them. But they, they weren't like Israel. They didn't have all the commandments and all the things of God. But God spared Nineveh. And anyhow, and every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, the Lord will bring on you until you are destroyed. Again, he destroyed, he does that. He'll destroy nations. God does that. You know, Jesus said, we're gonna, there will be wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation. And those things are going to happen. And he says, don't be alarmed at that. Why? It's the working of God. He not only saves you individually, he saves our town, he saves our country, he deals with nations, he deals with kings. God does that. And David built, a, built an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Thus the Lord was moved by, by prayer for the land and the plague was held back from Israel. Why? Because David made an offering and prayed and it stopped the plague. The plague was probably over in the taken a census of Israel. He leveled the path for his anger. He did not spare his soul from death, but gave over their life to the plague. But here's for us. This, this, this is really my ending one. I'll, I'll read it to you now. Uh, Psalm 91.10. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. Again, the Lord has offered to protect us. Now again, he might protect you from the virus by you staying at home. He might protect some by the virus by you going and visiting and praying for sick people. It's You do by faith what you do, and you don't judge the people who don't. Like if somebody didn't come to church today because they're afraid of the virus, and you went, gee, they don't have no faith. You have a problem. You don't know if they're home by fear or by faith. You know? At my age, I should stay at home. But I'll wait one more year. Thus they provoked him to anger with their deeds, and the plague broke out among them. And Phoenix, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, stood up and interposed, and the plague was stayed. One man, one man interceded. Moreover, I will send on you famine and wild beasts, and they will bereave you of children and plague. Uh, bloodshed will also pass through you, and I will bring the sword on you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Again, when sin's in the land. Ezekiel 6 says this, Thus says the Lord, clap your hands, stamp your feet, and say, Alas, we have, alas, because all, of all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, which will fall by sword, famine, and plague, because of the ab evil abominations. You know, when you read about Israel and the things that happened, because people think that Israel obeyed the law. Israel ne never obeyed the law. Why do you think they were cut off and we were grafted in? They didn't obey the law. They had the law. They had this wonderful law. They had the law of God, this, this sacred, righteous law, and they wouldn't abide by it. They'd commit sin and go make a sacrifice and think it's covered. It, it's, it's like, you know, you live in sin and you come to church and pray, Father, forgive me. Okay, it's taken care of and you go live in sin again. That, it's not going to keep working. Let me 
very dead again. Thus says the Lord God, clap your hands and stamp your foot and say, Alas, because of all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, which will fall by sword, famine, and pestilence. Goes on to say, there will be great earthquakes and in various places, plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs in heaven. That's Jesus talking when he says, a nation will rise against a nation. He's warning us. In fact, he tells us, when nation rises against a nation, don't be fearful. Now, you understand, you might have to run, you might have to move, you might have, but he'll take care of you. You know, when you watch the news, if you got all bummed out and fearful, you may need to be trusting the Lord. If you're living in sin, you better be fearful. In the book of Revelation, you know, Jesus warned us of those end times. It says, a third of mankind will be killed by the three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths. Then it goes on and says in Revelation 19, 20, 9 and 20, it says, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues listen to this, the angels of the Lord, if you read the book of Revelations, pour out wrath upon the earth. Okay? And it says, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and of brass and of stone and of wood which can neither see or hear nor walk. Plagues are poured out and they get mad and don't repent. You know, if the Lord strikes you down and you know you've had some secret sin that nobody knows but you and God and he thumps you for it, I pray you have the good sense to say, Lord, I blew it. Forgive me, Lord. And you can even be honest with God. Lord, I love this secret sin, but I know you hate it, so help me, Lord, to be free from it in Jesus' name. You, know, you, you have to deal with those things. And in, in Revelation 22, 18, it says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. You know, I am not fond of everybody having a conspiracy theory about the end times. Anything that happens, you know, like, oh, I wonder if this is it. I wonder if this is it. Consume yourself of walking in the spirit, doing the will of God, serving, loving, helping, doing what you do, worshiping God, and not don't worry about that stuff. If you have to flee, you'll know when to flee. I believe if you need to store up food, you'll know when to do that. We, we must trust the Holy Spirit to tell us and direct us and guide us through those times. But as far as this uh, virus that's going on now, uh, pray. You know, I, I would pray. I hope it gets stayed in America. It's I mean, it, 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 it goes boom. I mean, it doesn't just go ding, 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 ding. I mean, it goes mass. Um, of course, I saw a, Brother Tony gave me a video of, of Italy right now. And the people were self-quarantined. And they're in their houses and in their big apartment buildings, standing out on a balcony, and they're playing accordions and guitars, and they're singing songs, and they're having a party. So they're handling it pretty well. But again, some of it you make up your own mind on. If the government shuts things down, you, you can take that as the will of God because he's, he's the God of all authority. But pray that this thing passes. Amen. I know I kind of jumbled through this stuff and really didn't uh, get it as good as I'd like to. But what I want you to see is, I, I don't know if I've ever done a teaching on plagues, but plagues are a part of, of something God uses. And we hope he never has to use it. But at the end time, he's going to use it. And he's going to separate the wheat from the shaft. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And make sure you're a sheep. We honor God. We obey him. We submit to his authority. We love him and obey him. And he's our God. And the proof that he's your God is that you do that. And watch what he does for you. So bless the name of the Lord. Uh, again, hope you got something out of that. That was... I need to organize that and make it more presentable and do a PowerPoint and all that. And I don't know if I'm going to do much better than that. But I think we got the point across. Amen. Amen. Father, we do pray for this virus that's going around. And Lord, I pray that everyone who gets sick might repent and turn to you. And Lord, that those who are believers that might get this virus would call upon the elders and 
be prayed for and get well and be able to testify of your goodness that you got them through this. Lord, we pray for all the seniors that are kind of already have things wrong with them, Lord, that you protect them and keep them safe, Lord God, from this virus. But Lord, most of all, I pray that this would encourage America to look to you, to begin to pray, pray for our loved ones, pray for protection. But Lord, they would pray that we might be the nation that keeps your commandments, honors your name. Lord, we believe in Jesus and keep him as king and king of this country. So Master, bless us only you can. Be with your church today as we as we go our way. Be glorified in our lives and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless the Lord. God bless you. I love you. Stay away from the pain.